So, rock and roll to us is kind of part of our life, kind of our lifestyle. I mean, it's been around 60 years and we have a lot of images. It's very, it comes very naturally. It's everywhere. It's when we go to the store. It's, it's, it, it has its roots in kind of rebellion, liberation, uh, got political. Uh, but it's also kind of how we see ourselves in a really positive way and, and kind of somehow become how we see ourselves as Americans because uh, it, it makes us feel independent. It makes us feel like we act like individuals and it, it kind of frees us from a lot of you know, social conventions and musical conventions. Um, so what's interesting is that uh, when you take these feelings, and actually this is the one thing that we can actually export around the world, you know, as Americans, and not feel guilty of giving to other cultures. Well, this movie that Travis made um, is about a band uh, that started uh, as a rock and roll band, kind of the way our rock and roll band started in feeling, and it's something we can probably all relate to, but in a completely different and hostile environment, and that's Rock Couple. به خاطر من گیتار ما بردن نمیتونم تو خانه خود که پدر بسیار از موسیقی یا بعدش میان بخواهم گناهش نمید خود در افغانستان زندگی کرده بود و در اکمه ایتی بودیم که موسیقی یک نوع بد داره خب رفتیم خانه لمرشان گیتار ها نماندیم و میجه چای هم خوردیم باز خب تقریبا یک سال تیتی شد لمر آخر گفتم گیتار رو میبرم خانه شو گرفتم در نصف شو وقت گیتار که خیلی دارم و اون وقت, وقت بود که ما نمیتونستم که بگویم که گیتار رو مخدیم از کجا کردیم پیسه شه و خاطر که پیسه کورس کمپیوتر هم میرستم یا مسیخی گیتار میخوندم یا گیتار خیلی نبودم This is Kais, the guy in the film. <laughs> and Kais, what? <laughs> I think it might be good for everyone if Kais just describes what you just saw on the screen. So you need to tell that story really quickly. Yeah, so basically I grew up in a country that has been 35 years war. So I have seen just war, nothing just war. So, so and I grew up in, I'm the only band member that I grew up in Solven, a Russian Solven regime, Taliban, Mujahideen, so it's pretty like I have seen like bomb blasts and, and war, bullets, all these things, so I didn't pretty enjoy my life. I'm 28 years old, like, I haven't seen anything in my life because it was all fight, so so I grew up and I sometimes people ask me what was the enjoyment, that, what was the fun time that you had in, during the, the war, I said we didn't have anything. The only thing that we, we, we were having fun was just to go at the roof, rooftop, rooftop of our house and see where it was bombing. And where was dead people to go and see the dead people. That was, it's sad, but that's how the environment was. And we would go like playing with bullets. So we didn't have freedom, we didn't have a voice. So it was for us, Afghan culture is, you have to respect older people. You, you don't have a voice. We didn't, we didn't have a school, we didn't, I didn't grow up, I didn't educational very well because the educational system is really bad in Afghanistan. So that's how I grew up. Then I, then a youth troop when I came in Afghanistan, before that I, I lost my hope. 
I thought there's no hope, no future, so I'm done. One day I'm gonna die and that's it, there's no high. So, but when used troops come, then I feel, okay, maybe there's a, there's a hope. So there was a little bit slowly, like there's a local TV, radio stuff, like music shop. So I bought my guitar, but my family, my, especially my dad was like against music because he didn't want me to be in trouble because like when you play music in Afghanistan, it, music is really bad, they think, and it gives, because that's how they think you're playing music, you're like, you're doing really bad thing. So that's not something that you should do it. If you're doing it, they wanna kill you or do something bad to you or your family. So that's why my dad didn't let me to do that. And instead that he gave me money to go study English or study computer course. I said, okay, but I didn't tell my dad that I'm, I said, okay, I'm going to study English and computer class, but I hide, I, instead of going computer class, I took some guitar class and <laughs> I bought my first, gu for, first guitar. So, so for one year, I couldn't get my guitar to my house. It was in my cousin's house and, and I couldn't play. I had my guitar, but I have my toys to play with it after so long time, but I couldn't have it. It was sad, but I struggled a lot to, to tell my parents that music is not a bad thing. And I, it, like, this is who I am. That's gave me freedom. That's gave me like, like, that's my voice. So that's why like, that's how I grew up and that's like, bought my guitar and you see my story that how my life was in Kabul. So guys, can we have a listen to what you sounded like at the start? What happened when you discovered metal music? Well, first I discovered metal music because my cousin, he brought a CD from Metallica and he played and that was the moment that it changed my life and that was a new sound. It, yeah, like it was rough and heavy in a different way. Obviously in Afghanistan there was like bomb and all these bullet stuff like, like explosion, that heavy sound but that, that hurt people, but this sound like I feel it like that's this is something that I want to do that don't 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 hurt some people. That gave me energy and my voice. And when he played, and we were like didn't know that what we were doing. We were jumping around, having fun, and we said, okay, this is the only if this gave us an, an inspiration, gave us energy. So we should we should. Because that there were people in Afghanistan didn't know about rock music or anything. We said, okay, let's start a band. So that's how we started. So at first, it's so it's so hard to find a met like like local music to teach you just guitar, and like you couldn't find any like metal store or music school that teach you metal. So me me and my cousin were looking for a band. So it was really hard for us to to find a bandmate. And we met, finally we met Travis Beard in a coffee shop and he said, I have a band, I'm, I'm a journalist, I'm helping people and I have a studio if you guys wanna like come and practice. So then we told him that we, we are looking for some other Afghans if you could maybe 
find it and maybe you could introduce to other people, uh, other band members. So finally Travis find other two and he combined us and we went to practice in Hazard Studios for six months, then we play our first gig. <laughs> to make a long story short, the neighbors did complain and we were kicked out of that house and we probably moved about, I'd say three or four times over the seven years I lived in Afghanistan. Because every time we build a studio, they would come over and slam it out for a couple of months and then we get that knock at the door and the local sort of, let's say, you know, person of, of influence would say, I'm sorry, but we've taken it for long enough and it's time to move on. And so we did, um, but we found places for them to play and we found stages for them to play. Um, but the environment still is Afghanistan and rock and roll is, is the whole world over. We all know that, but playing in Afghanistan, there's a lot of other risks involved externally to that little studio, that little bubble that they were safe to play in. I experienced a suicide attack on the Indian Embassy. I was there in the queue for my visa. All of a sudden I heard a very, very fucking loud sound. The loudest thing I ever heard in my life. Like two or two or three seconds after the explosion, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what was. I mean, what 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 was it? Like, I couldn't analyze anything. And then after like after the fourth or fifth second, I saw people's faces and all that, and I was like, "Fuck! It was an explosion, and I'm alive." Here, the fear of sudden death is just. It's always there. <laughs> Stick to what is fucking real! This is the fucking reality. This is where there was a blast, 50 people died. Qasem was here. It was right here, yeah? Yeah, it was right here. When you see that that many people die, yeah? Uh -huh. Is it worth making rock and roll or should we just stop? That's the environment you have to make rock and roll in. Bill? So, you can see a lot of their songwriting had to do with the experience that they had while they were there. And as they were developing as a group, you know, they really had their environment to kind of work with, like, as far as your inspiration for songs. Well, when you're an artist or a musician, when you write a song, you, when you're a musician, you get inspiration by your real life. So when you see a song about heartbreaking an artist right, and also you see about like a dance, all these things, but we grew up with war. That was in, uh, that was in our real life. So wh why we, you guys see the video that it was about like bomb blast, and the song was uh, two seconds after blast. I have a story. My mom was calling me like every time, each time like there's a bomb blast. My mom was calling me that, are you okay? Like imagine like thousand, thousand other kids in, the, in Afghanistan would experience the same things. That, that's why we, would, we, we write song about real life, about like what we experienced. That was our medicine that take out, to get out of our body and show it to the world that, that Afghan or Afghan people don't deserve were or that's how, that's why we are reading this kind of song because we experienced that our band members experienced and even I experienced it was around us so that's why like we inspired how to write this kind of music. Yeah. But there was also some positive parts to this story. Um, as the scene sort of started to 
grow, we needed to make a bigger stage because we had these bands popping out of everywhere and then we obviously had all these Afghans that wanted to see these musicians perform. But they were playing behind closed doors at these very small gigs. And then I went and saw Uncle Sam and said, hey, I need some money to put on a festival. The first rock festival in 35 years. It took a lot of convincing, but they actually did agree in the end, and we put on this festival. And the Americans had this, this sort of strategy that if we throw money at things, the country will improve. Let's just carpet bomb the whole country with money and see if it fixes the problem. Uh, my job was as a cultural affairs officer. When I first met Travis, he talked a mile a minute and seemed slightly insane, but um, he was also very serious about the project. The US government is funding heavy metal. At first, we're like, we're funding that? Do you think the money was spent wisely? I don't know, I, it's, it's easy to say, uh, Hellfire Missile costs 175,000 pounds. You can fire a rocket at a fucking mud hut and, and knock down a mud hut and kill a family. Or you can give somebody a quarter of a million pounds to make a music festival. It's something that we've been hearing about for like more than two years. It's happening now, you know, I cannot yet believe that it's happening today. So. This is Afghanistan, this is Kabul. Obviously we do have incidents here which, you know, include things like, you know, gunfire, shootings, suicide bombers. It does happen. It's part of everyday life here, but it's not every day. Exactly. Security's pretty good, I mean, so far... No, it's not. Oh, uh, um, None of the security people have turned up. I think I've spoken to someone about this maybe close to 30 times. They're still not here, and every time I ask, they go, they're coming, they're on their way, they're 10 minutes, they're 10 minutes. They're not here, but the police are. Yeah, stage time. That was a pretty interesting thing. The first ever stage dive in Afghanistan. I was like, really? I did the first stage dive. When we left the stage, each and every band was like, what? Just to come now and say hello to the next generation. <laughs> So from that small little practice room all the way to the big stage was a, was a four year journey for the band, but they, they got there and it was an amazing achievement for not just District Unknown, but for us as well, because there was huge logistics involved in putting on a festival in a city like Kabul, security, equipment, electricity, um, promotion. We couldn't promote this festival, everything was done in a stealth sort of tactic where you would release small bits of information throughout the months coming up to the festival, but the actual date and location weren't actually revealed to the day itself because we had to keep in mind that there could be people that wanted to disrupt our festival and we couldn't have that kind of thing when we were having such valuable people on stage. Um, but without the Americans and the other foreign um, investments, it wouldn't have gone ahead. So we were very lucky to have that uh, input. But then what happened? The times changed. Then what happened is the troop withdrawal started and as the American troops left, so did the expat community and so did all the money. And unfortunately without money it's really hard to put on a rock festival. Um, and so there was, there was a whole exodus and everyone started to leave, including the Afghans, because without an economy you can't get a job and you can't survive. And so everyone started to leave the country, sadly. go-to word was car bubble. Car bubble is a bubble inside a bigger bubble, which is Afghanistan, a cultural bubble. With the West pulling out, with the whole sort of withdrawal, that bubble finally burst. And we will bring home a total of 33,000 troops by next summer. We won't try to make Afghanistan a perfect place. We will not police its streets or patrol its mountains indefinitely. 
That is the responsibility of the Afghan government, which must step up its ability to protect its people and move from an economy shaped by war to one that can sustain a lasting peace. I, I don't feel like our concerts in Afghanistan are going to be as secure. We will have to stop performing. There's no guarantee that if we try to escape, we can escape. So, Kais, yeah. you're in America. What happened? Well, after we had some concert and like in Sound Central, our band member, our frontman, uh, the vocalist, got arrested by Molas, and he was in prison for two days. And when he got back, and we there was a, we had to had discussion about this because it was his family's life was in danger too because his family lives in Nazar. So that's like like we, that. That's how the band decided that we should, because if if it was if, if it was my life, I wouldn't care because of music because that was my hobby, that was my passion. But if people were involved in our families, our family was in danger. So everyone decided in, in my band that we should get separate. Like we can't do this anymore. And some of them got visa and they got out of the country and. I wasn't a selfish guy to tell them, okay, no, we have to do this for young kids. That this, uh, this is what we want to do, you know, because that was our big dream. So it was hard for us to decide to leave the band and don't do metal music in Afghanistan. But, uh, but the situation just turned. At first, we didn't thought if it was about us, it was fine because I could, I totally get it because they didn't live in the in a, in Afghanistan, so. They scared and they said we we can continue. So I wasn't selfish. I said okay, no problem. We have to because I don't want to put your, you guys' family in trouble. So that's how we decided and, and said okay, we should get separate and do and get out of this country if they they could. You know, like. So what's happening in Afghanistan now in regards to the music scene? Is is there anything going on? Nothing, just nothing, because like there's no music scene. That there was just some central festival that you organized there. There's no more music. There were just two, three other bands. They they just run away when they got an opportunity in other countries. So there's no platform for Afghan. But still, I get emails. Still, I get messages from Afghan kids that they want like like festival. They want music because those kids need. More. Those kids need, need more, more music, more culture thing, you know. Because, like, I feel really bad sometimes because, like, I can't do anything because I don't want to put their life too. Because the same stage we performed, like, two, after two years, it was bombless in the same stage that we performed. So, so it's the security is bad. So all, so right now there's like we started, and there's still people like protesting those kids that they came and they learn in the festival. Now they are like girls. They raise their voice and talking about like, like they're doing protests, all this stuff. But there's nothing music scene in Afghanistan, and it's dead. It was just for three years, and for now it's it's it's, it's getting worse and worse. So on that note, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed at least to see a little bit of a window and something happening somewhere that you don't get direct information of. I mean, I didn't until I met this guy, and I studied a lot about Afghanistan, I read books about it, looked at the news, and it's nice to see, it's, it was really, it's interesting for me to see what's happening to real people. Um, we can talk about it some more tonight. We're gonna show other clips at 9 p.m. and uh, also do a Q&A if anybody wants to know anything in more detail. A bit more relaxed environment, maybe have a drink or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Chill a bit more. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.